Well, good morning. I never thought I'd see a photograph of a football player next to an auto radiograph from the old RFLP days, but so be it. But I thought I'd give you a little bit about my perspective, which was a prosecutor from a small town called San Diego asked to come to Los Angeles and learn about Hollywood in a rather rude way. And you really learn about Hollywood in a rude way when midway through the first direct examination I did of a witness, which was the first DNA witness called in the case, I discovered that the best source of information about how you did wasn't the nightly news or newspapers. Obviously, magazines take too long. It was The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, so I just happened to have a videotape of that. Got another video. Uh-oh. Got another OJ video. Uh-oh, uh -oh, look at Another MTV deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, the, you know the, the trial has been pretty boring for last week. Everybody understands that. All the technical testimony, DNA this. stuff. You know, first that Greg Matheson guy, now this Robin Cotton. Very dry, dry stuff. Gotten so bad. Judge Eno and the lawyers got together again this week, recorded a song about just how dull the trial has become. Kind of a, kind of a Bee Gees kind of thing. Uh -oh. Here, take a look, take a look. We initially, back in, uh, I believe it would have been 89, started looking at the feasibility of doing RFLP. Well, you can tell by the way I hide my yard. I'm born to test what's going on. Jury's on, they're not hungry, they're half asleep. Gosh, I miss Los Angeles. <laughs> but here's what I wake up to at night. In the middle of the night, I get a cold sweat, and I hear Johnny Cochran uttering this famous alliterative set of words, contaminated, cor oh, excuse me, corrupted, contaminated, and compromised. And it's kind of what I want to talk about just as to one issue that occurred in that case, because I think it has overtones in much of what goes on in forensic science. Obviously, what happened during much of the defense presentation, their cross-examination of witnesses called by the prosecution, dealt with the issue of whether or not evidence had been, in fact, contaminated. Contaminated whether in its collection, its preservation, its handling within the laboratory, its distribution to other laboratories, as Greg mentioned earlier. And the issue where that kind of, kind of raised its head, at least as far as I was concerned, and the issue that I probably litigated the most hotly, it had to do with some of the early work done by the LAPD. And in particular, in addition to the work that Greg described, which I had forgotten, in terms of his serological work, the LAPD had just recently begun using PCR-based DNA typing, typing at that early genetic marker called DQ-alpha that was read using these old test strips with reactions, either blue dots or not, depending on the types that were present, that were read a little bit like a Reader's Digest puzzle. And in particular, what the defense wanted to have admitted into evidence, and they knew that we were going to introduce these results from the LAPD, they wanted to in also introduce during cross-examination and the presentation of their own expert testimony what they believed was contamination that occurred to LAPD analysts as they were developing this technique in for use in the laboratory and their internal validation and proficiency tests. And they were correct in the sense that during certain time periods, these LAPD analysts that were relatively new to this technique had encountered instances of contamination. But what we countered with was evidence that in fact, whoops, picked the wrong one, sorry about that. <laughs> Too many computers. What they found and what the uh, contention that I argued to Judge Ito was that look, there was no evidence of any contamination that occurred in the testing in the Simpson samples. And in addition to that, there was no instances of contamination for about one week before the Simpson case samples were tested and about one week after. And what we also had, which I thought was powerful evidence to the judge, 
was the fact that, kind of like a carryover from the old serology days, the LAPD criminalists and evidence collection specialists had taken for every sample of blood or other biological evidence that they collected at the crime scenes, of which there were several, they also collected what was called an unstained substrate control, which meant for every blood stain taken off the sidewalk, they collected a similar sample immediately adjacent to that blood stain, which was a holdover from the ABO typing days, if I recall correctly, to determine whether or not any types that came out of that blood stain might be from some background reactions as opposed to the blood itself. And in all of the results that the LAPD obtained using PCR DQ alpha testing, they were clean results and there were no reactions from any of the unstained substrate controls. So the results themselves were remarkably clean, particularly considering the very large volume of samples that were taken and ultimately tested. So that was the argument. On the one hand, the defense wanted to show there was contamination that was encountered in the laboratory, albeit not related to the case. And on the other hand, my contention that that particular set of results and that other instances of contamination simply weren't relevant and would confuse the jury. Now, we operate in California like all states and the federal government. And the federal government under the federal rules of evidence, it's called evidence code section, or rule of evidence 403. California, it's evidence code section 352, and there is one of those varieties in every state to my knowledge of the country. Basically, the general rule of law is all relevant evidence is admissible unless there's a good reason to keep it out. And those good reasons are generally that the prejudicial effect of that testimony substantially outweighs its relevance. Well, there wasn't really an issue of prejudicial effect in this case about those instances of contamination. But what my contention was is it was going to take too much time. And even more importantly, it was going to confuse the jury. And that's a valid basis to keep that evidence out. Well, after we argued it for some time, and I thought Judge Ito was about to keep all of that evidence out of that contamination, agreeing with our contention that, look, it just isn't relevant to this case because the LAPD's results were so clean. And again, it was about one week in each side of the casework testing. There were no instances of contamination. But ultimately, the judge reached a decision. In the criminal case, how many of you think, well, let me ask it a different way. Given the backdrop I've given you, how many of you think in the criminal case that evidence of the other instances of contamination in other casework, actually mostly proficiency testing and validation, how many of you think that should have been admissible at the trial? Ooh, not many hands went up. You all want to apply to be a judge? <laughs> how many of you think it shouldn't have been admissible at the trial? How many of you are awake? Okay. <laughs> Well, the answer is, in the criminal case, Judge Ito admitted it, and that led to extensive cross-examination of the LAPD analysts, as well as presentation of their own defense expert testimony as well, that set out in detail those outbreaks as they use the term of contamination. There was cross-examination that was lengthy by me of that same expert, bringing out basically that there was no evidence of contamination in the casework specific samples. But that's kind of an example of how the law works in deciding admissibility. In the subsequent civil case, just the opposite conclusion was reached by the trial judge. That trial judge felt that that evidence wasn't sufficiently relevant to the decision the jury had to make. And he granted that what we call evidence code section 352 motion to keep out those instances of contamination. Two different rulings, two different contexts, basically dealing with the identical evidence. So I think it's an interesting example of how courts can reach different conclusions even based on the same facts.